Hello and welcome. For today's video, we're going to be driving a car that handles like a snake. Not sure which car I'm talking about? What if I told you it competes directly with the Neo ET7 and the Tesla Model S here in the Chinese market? Oh, and the brand was co-founded by internet giant Alibaba. You still don't know? All right, I'll just show you. We got our hands on the much anticipated IML7. IAM, which stands for Intelligence in Motion, is a joint venture between SAIC, China's largest automaker, and Alibaba, its largest tech company. Oh, and some property developer named Zhangjiang High Tech. The L7 has two trim levels, Dynamic and Pro, priced at 50,000 and 56,000 US dollars respectively. Our dynamic trim car had the optional leather upgrade and massaging front seats, so it costs around 53,000 US dollars. The Neo ET7 is priced between 62 and 73,000 US dollars here in China. The Tesla Model S, it starts at 123,000. I'm a firm believer in the idea that cars always look better in motion, but there is a select group of vehicles that manage to convey a sense of uh, athleticism even when parked. The IM L7 is such a vehicle. Even when standing stock still, this thing looks like a shark that's ready to propel itself through traffic. The L7 also has one of the best applications of LED lighting we've seen on a vehicle. Much like the Hi-Fi X, it has LED panels front and rear that it uses to display images, ranging from the adorable to the useful. It also has DLP projectors that can project images onto the surface of the road. But the most striking element on the L7 are the daytime running lights, which give this car one of the most distinctive light signatures available today. They are arranged in the shape of an epsilon, the fifth letter in the Greek alphabet. Epsilon has a variety of meanings across different fields. For example, in the field of mathematics, it represents an arbitrarily small quantity. In the field of finance, it represents the percentage change in an option value with respect to the underlying yield. Maybe the people at IM are big finance geeks, but then again, they probably just chose it because it looks cool. The rear light signature is also very striking, with more than a hint of Aston Martin to the way this light curves upwards into a duck lip spoiler of sorts. We complained quite a bit about the trunk of the Neo ET7, which is very small for a car of that size. This thing is an identical 5.1 meters in length to the Neo, however its trunk is obviously deeper and taller than the ET7s. However, this opening, pretty small. There is no frunk on the L7, just as there is no frunk on the ET7. However, IM saw fit to spruce things up a bit by adding this see-through panel, underneath of which is a tire pump. Now, if you look on the orange panel here, it says performance edition and then the power level, except this base car and the higher trim level car have the exact same amount of power. Does that mean that every version of this car is a performance edition? Or does it mean that every version is a standard edition? The L7 has electronically operated front doors, so if I hit this button on the key fob, it'll pop open for me. To close it, I hit the button here on the door, or I press the brake pedal. I think I've made it clear at this point that I'm a big fan of the exterior styling of the L7, but that love doesn't really extend to the interior. When I assess an interior, I do so based on two different categories. How does it look and how does it actually feel to use? In that first category, I would say this thing is a big winner. It looks very premium and high tech with some interesting features that separate it from rivals such as the ET7. Take for example, the three screen system here. You have a 26.3 inch screen that acts as your instrument cluster and center screen. Then you have a 12.3 inch passenger screen. And finally, a 12.8 inch lower screen that uses the menu functions and stuff like that. You can also raise and lower this screen at the touch of a button. That's not all. The L7 has a very slick wireless charging pad. It's actually hard to spot at first, but when you place your phone on the center console, it lowers down to create a little cubby. Even the door switches have a very sci-fi vibe. 
They are capacitive touch buttons built into a floating silver piece. I've never seen anything like it, and it looks great. But then we get to that second category. How does it feel to actually use? And well, I'm a lot less satisfied when it comes to that. These three screens look great, but this lower screen, well, the font is too small and the screen is literally too low for you to actually be able to operate it easily, especially when you're driving. Doing things like changing your driving mode makes you take your eyes off the road for way longer than I consider to be acceptable. This charging pad, well, it looks cool and it's especially cool that it lowers down, but it's a little bit finicky. If you put your phone on it, not in the exact right position, there we go, it won't lower. And when I mentioned it was slick, I meant that in both senses of the word. It's slick as in it looks cool, and it's slick as in it's slippery. This Performance EV, every time you take a turn at speed, you can hear your phone going back and forth like that. There are rubberized versions available, but our car obviously doesn't have it. Finally, these super sci-fi window switches, God, they look great, but they're very hard to use accurately. In order to lower the window in one go, you have to I don't know if it's double tap or long press. I've been driving this car for almost a week and I really cannot get them to work accurately. Another example of looking good but not being easy to use, here on this chrome panel there are actually some hidden buttons that will only appear when you bring your finger close to them. One, it's a little hard to get them to appear, but two, when they do, they're almost impossible to see if there is any kind of sunlight. The only way I've been able to see them is to... Oh, there we go. Now I can see them. The L7's interior feels like a case of form over function, but there's still much to recommend about sitting inside this car. The seats, both front and rear, are soft and supportive, more supportive than an ET7. However, the rear seat of the L7 does lack some of the features found on the Neo, including the rear touchscreen and adjustable headrests. What it does have, and this is available on both rear passenger seats, is an ability to mute the sound system in the car. Never seen that on any other car. When it comes to legroom, it's slightly smaller than that of the ET7, despite having a slightly longer wheelbase, probably due to that extra space in the trunk. Headroom, though, slightly better than the ET7. All versions of the L7 come equipped with the same dual motor powertrain, making 425 kilowatts and 725 newton meters of torque, aka 575 horsepower and 540 pound feet. There's also only one battery pack option, a 93 kilowatt hour lithium ion unit providing 615 kilometers of CLTC range. That big battery can't be swapped like a Neo, but it does support 11 kilowatt wireless charging. Not sure where you can actually find a wireless charger like that, but that's a separate issue. I also mentioned that it drives like a snake, or at least that's what the official press material says. According to the company, this car has the power, handling, and tuning necessary to provide the driving characteristics of the legendary Black Mamba. <laughs> That tuning was done by Williams Engineering of F1 fame. The team at Williams tuned the suspension of the L7, including the springs, shocks, and anti-roll bars. Bringing the L7 to a stop are Brembo brakes, just like the Neo ET7. Unlike the ET7, this car does not have an air suspension, instead using traditional springs. Is it able to overcome this seeming handicap through the power of Williams Engineering? Yeah, actually, kind of. But first, the bad news. This car doesn't ride as comfortably as an ET7. It's also not as cosseted, not as isolated from the bumps and potholes of the outside world. If the ET7 is a magic carpet ride, this is more like a very plush rug. But when it comes to handling, the L7 is pretty impressive for a big electric sedan. It may not have air suspension, but it does have continuous damping control with three different modes, normal, comfort, and sport. The sport mode firms up the suspension without making it feel brittle and adds real heft to the steering. And power? Well, it's just as quick as you would expect. 
Zero to 100 kilometers per hour is dispatched in just 3.87 seconds, and it's done in a rather undramatic fashion thanks to the standard Pirelli P0 tires, which are staggered, by the way. 245 up front, 275 in the rear. The steering wheel doesn't transmit a ton of information about what those tires are doing, but it is more communicative than I would expect from such a large electric sedan. That's not a high bar, but the L7 sails over it. When it comes to driver assistance systems, the L7 falls behind the ET7 in terms of hardware, having only cameras and radar instead of the LiDAR of the Neo. That means the ET7 is a bit more future-proofed, but in terms of what they can actually do today, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference at this point. Like the ET7, the L7 has available highway navigation on autopilot, lane change assist, and a variety of safety systems. Williams Engineering also tuned the four-wheel steering on this car, which means it does have rear-wheel steer, up to 12 degrees of it. That means better stability at high speeds and a much tighter turning circle than a car that doesn't have rear steer, a car like the ET7, for example. That brings me around to my final conclusion when it comes to that comparison. At $12,000 more than the base price of this car, the ET7 definitely comes with some interesting technology, things like the LiDAR, the battery swapping, and the air suspension. But honestly, if you want the more driver-focused car, it's probably this one. The ET7, probably the better luxury car. The L7 is a bit of a tough nut to crack. On the one hand, I really love the way it looks, both inside and out, but that interior is just not user-friendly. The thing that puts me over the edge and allows me to recommend this car is the fact that it has the best handling of any large mid-sized Chinese EV sedan currently available today. I know that's a very specific praise, but it is an important one.